We're in the final week of our series, How to Wage Peace. And throughout this series, we've tried to come at this discussion from interesting angles with the hope of giving us some things to think about when we think about peace and fear and why we make enemies. So before we get to this week, let's quickly recap where we've been so far. Way back in week one, we looked at an episode from the life of King Solomon to help us understand how God demands justice for all and not just some. In week two, Chris reminded us to be comfortable with a nuanced reading of the scriptures and to remember that just because a story shows up in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is cool with what happened. Chris also reminded us that whenever we're in doubt about who God is or what God wants or God's take on violence, we remind ourselves that God came to earth to show us exactly who he is, what he wants, and what he cares about. And in a way, he was nothing like what we expected. In week three, Dustin taught us the importance of how wounds and understanding what's behind those wounds is vital to living in peace with one another. And last week, week four, Cindy encouraged us to immerse ourselves in better stories, complicated stories, and not to reduce others to a one-dimensional story or clickbait or a meme or a joke. Now, for today, I'm inviting you to listen in on a conversation I had with Heather Peters. Heather's is the peace building coordinator for the Mennonite Central Committee here in Saskatchewan, and she'll be offering us some very practical tools as she shares about peace building and human security. Here it is. Hi, Heather. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks for investing in Lakeview Church in this way. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah. Ready for the first question? Totally. Okay, here it is. So talk to us a little bit about peace building and human security. What's it all about? And then what does it look like in real life? Yeah, sure. So um, human security, it's actually very interesting that you've asked about that. I feel like many people don't think about human security or that, that term. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know where this came from or your question came from, and perhaps we should have talked about in the back. But anyways, so human security, um, this term was popularized in the mid-1990s um, in the United Nations, and it sort of goes alongside human development. Okay. So um, rather than like human development is like building people up, and human security is, is more about how we... Um, provide safety for people to make their own choices. Hmm. Um, often when people hear the word security, they think about police, military, these institutions mm -hmm. um, that are there to protect not only people, but also resources. Um, but the human security part is really looking at how do we as humans, as people, um, keep each other safe hmm. so that we can meet our needs. So when I think about human security, I think of this um, interaction I had. I lived in South Sudan from 2010 to 2012 with MCC. Mm -hmm. And one day in the market, this guy came up to me, as many people came up to, to white people there. And he said, oh, well, how many people are in your family? And I said, oh, you know, like the, I have I have a brother and a sister and parents and my partner. That's it. And he was like, that's it? And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, in Canada, you must not have very many enemies. And I was like, well, why? He's like, well, here you need to have very large families. Hmm. You need to, we need to have a lot of people connected to us um, to protect ourselves. Hmm. And so I, was, I think about that. Often I think about like, well, what does enemies mean? But I also think about like this idea of kinship. And when we are connected to many people, we feel protected and supported. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what human security is. Mm -hmm. Being connected to people so that we feel supported and so that we can make good decisions, hopefully. Now, for do you think that thank you, thank you, oh. thank you for, for, <laughs> for explaining that. Like, do you think that 
that's a problem for us here? Like, are there people who don't have people? So when you bring that up, like, what does that, what does that mean for us, you know, living here in Saskatoon? Well, yeah, I think like we can, we think of that, we can, in North America, Mm -hmm. we can make that very easily into a very individualistic idea. Mm. Um, Because we're so good at thinking about, well, how does this help me? Or how does this benefit me? Um, but really human security is a community thing and, um, we are all connected to people, Mm -hmm. you know, even when we feel like maybe we are not, we're all, we all have family. We all are, um, connected to the people we live close by our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Um, we can find community in our workplaces. Um, you know, some people have larger groups and other people but but we are all are connected to each other and I think in North America we need to um, often make be mindful of our connections with people so that we don't become too inward focused so then how is human security tied to peace Peace building building. yeah totally so if we need people in our lives we are not all the same right we have different perspectives we have a different personalities um and so there's going to be conflict. Conflict is inevitable to all relationships and all connections. Um, conflict doesn't have to be bad. But if we do not handle conflict well, it can become harmful and it can become violent. Mm. And so peace building is a way to um, make sure that conflict is something that we learn from and grow from rather than something that harms us. Um, And it's a a spectrum. So hopefully we can use peace building to be preventative so that we are not harming people. Mm -hmm. But when we do harm people or when we have been harmed, Mm -hmm. because it happens, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, peace building gives us tools to, to, to move forward in a good way. Um, I think of peace building as a way to look at the harms and the hurt that has happened Mm. and and figuring out where that came from and how it impacted you and how it impacted the people around you and your community. Mm. Um, Then uh, then I think of peace building as, well, what do we do about that harm? How do we think of creative ways to heal from it? Mm. And we can use restorative justice um, tools and frameworks to, to think of different ways to to heal from harm. And then ultimately, where are we going? Where do we want to be going? And I, I like the idea of reconciliation and moving toward this sort of unified space. And so that, that's a spectrum I often use when I'm thinking and working and talking about peace building. So what I think I'm hearing as you're explaining these things um, is that we can't do this alone. We can't do peace alone. We can't do life alone. And where there has been conflict, we can't heal on our own. So can you speak to that a little bit and help us understand why we need one another to do this peace thing well? Mm -hmm. When there has been harm that has happened to to someone, it it sometimes can feel like a very personal thing and that it's only impacting me. Um, But that's not what is actually happening in reality. And and the fact that that some external force caused us harm Mm -hmm means that an external force, whether it often it is people, needs to be with us as we heal from that harm. Mm-hmm. We can't ever heal um, alone. Uh, we heal in relationships with other people and by walking with other people and learning and um, being supported by other people. All right, let's take things one step deeper. <laughs> so we know that threats to peace and threats to human life aren't necessarily isolated incidents. And it, it seems like our world is caught in cycles of abuse, cycles of injustice. So maybe explain those cycles as you see them and maybe talk to us a little bit about how restorative justice reverses those cycles. Yeah, we can definitely get caught into cycles of violence. And those cycles can be small um, and they can grow larger. So I I think we should define what cycles of violence actually means. Go for it. Or how I interpret it. So 
Um, I think of it sort of as a figure eight. Um, so on one side, we, there has been harm or hurt that has happened. And maybe because of our reaction to it, um, maybe because of other people's reactions to it towards us, we uh, can feel shameful, embarrassed, um, and bad about it, right? And, and, and then we can start to act in and actually harm ourselves with those negative self-talks. If it's larger, sometimes we actually physically self-harm ourselves. Um, sometimes we, we try to like push it out and we, do, we overwork or we numb, numb this sort of pain that we've experienced through drinking or, you know, other, other things like that. So we are harming ourselves internally. Um, but because we are in relationship, in kinship with people around us, yeah. um, our, uh, our interactions always impact other people. And so usually that acting in cycle will harm somebody else, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, either like, we are ignoring them, we are ignoring the relationship, or maybe we want someone to hurt. Like we feel like we are hurting so much and we want someone else to also be hurting like that. Or we want revenge and we actually like go out and purposely hurt someone. And so we have now um, this internal of acting in circle has um, created this eight where now we are acting out and harming other people. And so we can do this yeah, so I, this looks like revenge. It looks like calling other people names. It means, um, you know, all these, like, violence toward other people. So when you say it's in a cycle, so in that part of it, so there's that anger or vitriol or whatever, and it's inside me, then it spurs out, and then, it, like, I pollute other people, and then it yeah. comes back to me. Because then, then you, feel, you usually feel bad about it, right? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't actually, like, it doesn't make you feel vindicated in the, right. like, in the long term. And, and you feel like, well, maybe I'm actually sort of a bad person for doing this. And then you act in again. Mm -hmm. And so it's a cycle. And it can be individual. Like it can be just within your relationship with your, with your significant other, with sure. your spouse, with your kids. Right. Um, but it can grow bigger. And it can, we can see this cycle in groups of people mm. in, in country dynamics um, where groups of people who have been oppressed – when they come out of that oppression, they begin to oppress other people. Right. And so, um, and these cycles can like be really small and can be resolved within a day if they're, mm -hmm. you know, if it's just between two people. Right. But they can go on for generations as well. Absolutely. So I would challenge you. I don't think we could ever reverse these cycles. Okay. Tell me but why. We can, well, we can't go back from an action that's already happened. Okay. So then we then, can't take it back, but we can re we can break the cycle tell, and yeah. we can interrupt the cycle. So, yeah, let's talk about that in, interrupting the cycle. Yeah. What does that actually look like? And yeah. can, can you talk about it in terms of restorative justice? That's yeah. a term or an idea that we've, we've talked about here at Lakeview before. Mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear your spin on it as well. Yeah. So restorative justice, so, you know, it, it really asks three important questions when it comes to harm. Um. It's, it's asking who has been harmed in this situation. Mm -hmm. Often it's more than one person. Sure. But um, so who has been harmed? What does that person need to heal from the harms? And then who is responsible for addressing those needs? Hmm. So again, we have to always be looking about who is included around us yeah. and who can support and uplift each other. Um, and, and it's also about not the, the person who caused the harm mm -hmm. to be punished, mm -hmm. but up, instead uplifting the person who has been hurt. Because hmm. they themselves are caught in their own cycle yeah. that they're now dragging others right. into. So that is how we interrupt the cycle, is by addressing the harms so that people don't act in and then act out on those harms, but can heal from okay. those harms. Okay. okay, so that makes sense. And if I'm hearing you correctly, those cycles that we're caught in aren't only caught, you know, it's not only just, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that again, try again, all right. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there are cycles that we're caught in as individuals, 
You know, we can get caught as a people group in those cycles as well. And sometimes if those cycles go on long enough, they actually get baked into systems or systems are built on them. So now you're not just breaking a cycle necessarily for one person, but there's a whole system that's in question. Mm -hmm. So can you share the story that you shared with me about how a system has been disrupted in your own experience or a story that you've heard that you can share that perhaps can encourage our community in yeah. this direction? Yeah, so um, a common story in the work of restore, restorative justice is a story that came out from Ontario in the 1990s. Um, there was a man who had served his whole term in, in jail for um, sexual offenses. Okay. And um, he was about to be released into the community and, and was at a very high risk to reoffend. Um, so there were protests. You know, people didn't want this guy in their community. They felt like it would be unsafe for him to be there. Right. Um, so they, they protested with signs and the picket lines and they were like, we, we don't want this guy here. Um, so, but there was also a pastor in the community who, who was like, well, if we don't want this guy to, to hurt someone else, to reoffend, why don't we bring him in? Like, let's bring him closer to us so we can see what he's doing, so but, we can walk alongside him. But isn't that counterintuitive? Because don't you usually want to keep that kind of person away? Why would you invite someone like that into your close circles? It's scary, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think our reaction is to, to push away from things that are scary. But this guy wasn't doing it alone. Right. He was doing it with a group of other people in his church. The pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And how does that story end? Go yeah. Ahead. So, so the pastor went to the um, people in the correctional center. Yeah. Um, this system that has, I think, been based on uh, un these understandings of cycles of, of violence, uh, mm -hmm. um, and the cycle is often perpetuated yeah. within this system. And and he said, the pastor said, um, you know, why don't you place this guy into our community, we will form a circle of support hmm. and accountability for him and, and, and help him settle into the community, help him with this, the daily things he needs to, to be reintegrated into the community mm -hmm. and to keep the community safe. And they said, well, we can try that for sure. <laughs> and so, so this guy was settled into the community, I think it was Hamilton, and he never reoffended. He was at a 100% chance of reoffense, and wow. and for the next 20 years, he did not um, reoffend. That sounds miraculous. Yeah. But what do you think happened in that community that uh, led to this successful outcome? Hmm. I mean, the church itself had this, like many things. It this was an idea that just came out of the blue. This, this church community had done a lot of like prison work before, so they had been in the institutions, had mm. talked with people who had been stuck in these um, the cycles of violence, yeah. who saw themselves in prison over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they had explored many different ways to ha try to uplift and uphold people so that they could break the cycles of incarceration. Um, and so this was just like another tool that they were trying out, that they were building. I think when we talk about peace building, um, you know, I know Chris talked about this. Hmm. We need to be creative and I, we need to be curious. And I always like think about curiosity and creativity as really core parts of peace building. Mm -hmm. um, you know, often it's really easy to go along with the status quo, even if that status quo is hurting other people um, because there is an inertia to our life and sure. our life is crazy and busy and it's sometimes just easier to do that. Um, but when we actually realize that there is harm happening mm -hmm. and our community can be breaking apart mm -hmm. and not even our community but other people's communities right. are breaking apart because of our actions, um, we need to be creative and curious mm -hmm. um, in order to, to do that peace building work. Now, as you say those things, you're, you're echoing what our, our past uh, communicators or interviewees had said. 
It's like you're saying, well, intentionally put yourself in that situation, like on purpose. Whereas, you know, naturally, if I see trouble or someone I don't like, I'm going to I'm going to do my best to avoid that and get out of the way. But it sounds like you're saying, well, get yourself in the way. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, to an extent. Um, You know, everyone's at a different place. I would say, like, if you feel capable, if you feel like you have the support and strength around you, it's much easier to get it to get place yourself in those those spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not saying like you as an individual should just like go walk into a violent like conflict and try to stop it. That probably isn't that helpful. But perhaps if you are um, connected with a group of people who are trying to figure out how to best solve these problems, then yeah, get in the way. Be curious and creative and try to explore different ideas of how to resolve to resolve the conflicts. So then practically, how do we get in the way? And what I mean by that is as disciples of Jesus, if we want to get on board with what God is doing in his reconciliation work here in Saskatoon, what opportunities are available to us as groups and as individuals? Again, like right here, practically in Saskatoon. Yeah, like there are so many opportunities to be peace builders, um, and to show God's reconciling love. I would say, first of all, you need to start with yourself. Okay. Learn your own story about what harm and resilience has been ingrained in you. Mm -hmm. Um, Learn about how you deal with conflict. What are your go-to conflict styles? Um, because sometimes those styles are helpful and sometimes they're not. And if we can explore different ways to handle conflict, we can resolve conflict in better ways. So first start with yourself. Mm -hmm. There are so many other opportunities like locally for how to be involved in things too. This example from Ontario, the circles of support and accountability has turned into this like international, um, practice and, and organization that works with people who are coming out of jail who are high risk offend- to reoffend mm-hmm. and uh, provides uh, circles for them. And so we have uh, one organization in Saskatoon, there's three in Saskatchewan um, that do this work. In, in Saskatoon, it's called the MICA Mission. And so there's m- volunteer opportunities in that organization for people to be involved in those circles. Um, Yeah, so place yourselves in those places where people are trying to figure out their own cycles Hmm. of violence and and so that you can understand and see people's perspectives and their life stories. It it helps build compassion, which is also so core to being peace builders. Um, In non-COVID times, I teach a restorative justice, well, we do restorative justice circles within the Saskatoon Correctional Centre where we invite Um, people from the outside to come in with us Mm -hmm. and we all learn together about restorative justice so people can volunteer to do that with me post-covid hopefully um you know learn about what's going on uh with reconciliation saskatoon so many they do activities and learning opportunities monthly and that will help people sort of look at um different perspectives and, and and, and that sort of forward thinking about where do we want to be going here with our society and, and, and in, in, our, in our city, in our community. And then if you don't have time to like actually be personally involved in these local organizations or committees or learning opportunities, because I know people are busy, hmm. um, donate financially to them. Um, you know, they... they have small budgets and they work on like shoestring um, means, but yeah. they can always use more money to do this work. And it's and the the work that they do um, is successful in bringing more more peace to our communities. Okay. So last question then: If there are organizations right here in Saskatoon that we can get involved in, that's one way we can work towards peace building. If we can't do that, there is a financial component that people can give and support those who are doing the work. But then maybe as a last word, personally speaking, for someone like me and like you in our own circles, how can we as individuals work towards human security and peace building in our own lives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I've been doing this work 
for many years and in many different places in the world. Um, but like the most impactful times of my life was when I actually looked really deep to figure out like, well, how do I bring do peace building in myself mm -hmm. and in my own family? Um, because all of a sudden you start to uncover these really deep uh, wounds that um, are hard. <laughs> And, and you realize that those wounds um, have, have impacted you and how you interact with people around you and sometimes not the best ways. Um, and so I would say as individuals, we should always be sort of digging deep to, to figure out how we can um, bring out the best in ourselves mm -hmm. because that brings out the best in other people. Um, we are uplifting humanity and, and figuring out uh, how to move forward in the best way. So then, to, to, to tie this all up with a nice bow and conclude, you've talked about these cycles that perpetuate violence and injustice, but if I'm hearing you right in this last part, perhaps part of our calling towards peace building and human security is authoring new cycles that mm. bring life and hope and healing. So what would your last word be on those lines to the Lakeview Church community? Yeah, I feel like um, if we can really understand cycles of violence and where our actions can come out of a place of harm, um, equally we can see how our actions can come out of a place of building up and, and um, building resilience. Mm -hmm. So we are resilient people we know so there's this interesting study actually because mm. I, I do a lot of trauma work and um when we when you do trauma work it's really easy to get sucked into like the negative aspects of trauma just mm. like when you're talking about peace it's really easy to get sucked into you know what happens when we don't have peace around us um but with both of those things on the other side of them is this really positive growth that we can we can experience, mm -hmm. not only as individuals, but as a community and as a society, where we are building each other up because we have experienced that within ourselves. And so because we have come out of something, an experience, mm -hmm. and feel like we have become stronger, have become more competent, mm -hmm. more confident, we want to see that in other people around us as well. And so then we are propelled to do that work ourselves and to build each other up. Um, and we're called to do that as Christians, um, to build each other up so that we are working toward being witnesses of God and Jesus in our communities. Heather, thank you so much for this. I've learned a lot from you today, and this has been great for our church. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay then, allow me to quickly summarize some of the big ideas and tools that Heather passed our way. Number one, human security is about creating positive connections and safe spaces. Two, healing is not possible in isolation. Three, be aware of the cycles of harm that have been normalized. Four, contribute to cycles that build peace and resiliency. And five, get in the way. Interrupt cycles of harm beginning with your own. Allison, how can we bring those ideas to life for another week? What a great way to end our series. Heather touched on almost all of the practices that we've already mentioned this month. But just let me remind you of them if you need some help. First, read the Bible. Engage with the story that calls us to reimagine what it means to work justice and build peace in our day and time. Learn to listen, especially with those you're experiencing conflict with. Listen to understand and not simply to be understood. Open yourself up to the stories of others. Read and expose yourself to the stories of people, especially that you hold biases against, those far off and those near. Engage in the rigorous call of discipleship to complicate the storyline. 
and find some time to integrate your own story. Spend time with God, becoming aware of the ways you act out of unexamined hurt and perpetuate cycles of harm. And then open yourself up to the vulnerability and grace and healing that God offers. Now the final practice for this month's series is active prayer. Now that might seem like an oxymoron, but it's not. Because prayer is not only done quietly in the corner on our own, Prayer is putting love for God and others in action. Prayer is not only done in secret or in quiet. Prayer is also what we do with our lives as God does God's work of healing in us. And as Heather said, healing does not just happen to us as individuals. Healing happens in community. It draws people back together in connection and mutuality. Peace is built not just as we experience the peace and love of God in our own hearts or our lives of solitude, but as we work to build that peace in the world, and in particular when we pay attention to the lives of those who have been victimized by cycles of harm. Now there's a deep scriptural mandate to meet the needs of the world because God loves the world. Jesus makes it clear that to serve others is sacramental. It is a way to meet and incarnate God. There's something really holy about it. And when we look at Jesus, we see what God is like. And Jesus shows us that God heals, washes feet, serves, notices those on the outside of the circle, accepts interruptions from others as part of his calling. And then when Jesus ascends, he calls us to be his body, his hands and feet, on task in the work of restoration. And he also tells us that when we serve the most vulnerable, we serve him. We are the body of Christ, but the bodies of the most vulnerable are also his body. And so serving others is holy. When we serve others with love and humility, we enter into a place of communion with God and with one another. And that is prayer. You see, prayer has two sides. It is the time we spend in contemplation and quiet with God, but it is also the way that God uses that time to energize us and send us out into the world to love and serve others. If we miss one side of prayer, we're kind of like a stale body of water with no input and or no output. There is no flow and we become stagnant and often our prayer life just dries up. So we've already talked about contemplative prayer, but here is your invitation to practice active prayer this week. Find a place of prayer. So in one of my homes, I had a little nook in my room right beside a window. And in a time of chaos and hopelessness for me, I decided to build a place of prayer in that little nook. I started by putting a little rug down and then I put candles on the windowsill and one by one I hung verses and pictures on the wall that I meditated on and thought about as I prayed. I created a place where I went to pray, a spot where I intentionally turned my heart and mind to God and opened myself up to grace and trust. The dislocation and discomfort in my life became an invitation to build a place of prayer. Now, how about just as you might have a spot in your home that is your place to pray, how about if we find a situation, a relationship, a cause that is like a place of prayer? Now, here's how I imagine that we could do it. First, we would pay attention to the things in the world that break our heart. We might pay attention to where discomfort is an invitation to prayer. So what injustices live in your body, raise your heart rate, make you angry or sad or overwhelmed? In your time of prayer and solitude, you could ask God to help show you these parts and imagine what justice would look like in these situations, and then ask him how you could be a part of that justice. In short, you would ask God what to do. So often the places where we are drawn to enact justice are also the areas in our lives where we need healing or have experienced some measure of healing but still have some vulnerability and some weakness. And so when we engage in works of justice, we're also participating in our own healing or working from our scars 
so that we can do those works with compassion. You see, when we work for others and serve out of our weakness, there's more room for God. We open ourselves up to God's provision and creativity in our service because we don't have it all figured out. We're serving out of humility and compassion and not power. And that is prayer. So wherever God is blessing you with discomfort, wherever you sense that invitation, start building a nook, a place of prayer around that discomfort. So what would this look like? Well, you might really want to participate in reconciliation, but you have no idea what you're doing or where to start. Well, just start with a rug on the ground. Maybe that means visiting Reconciliation Saskatoon online or the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. Uh, you click on a few tabs, you learn something new, and as you do this, you open yourself up to God. You tell God that you want to learn and grow and that you want to be a part of healing. Then maybe you attend a webinar or when COVID is over, you attend a learning gathering or maybe on June 21st, we'll actually get to walk together. Maybe you make a new friend. Now you've put up a picture and lit a candle. You're building a place of prayer. And each time as you enter into these spaces, you ask God to help you, to humble you and to bring healing in and through you. And then you just keep entering your place of prayer, trusting that God will lead you. One other way that we can engage in active prayer is by submitting to the circumstances of our lives. And this is an encouragement for those of you who have very full lives. This is also a way of practicing peacemaking in our own work and home, like Heather encouraged us to do. So when I was in grad school, I was mom of one little person and I was expecting my second baby. And a lot of the reading that I had to do was by spiritual mystics who lived a cloistered life. So they were monks who lived in abbeys or desert fathers who lived in caves, which meant that they withdrew from society in order to practice their spirituality. And I remember writing in one of my papers in response to one of these readings, something like, this man is not potty training a toddler and puking every morning when he brushes his teeth. I don't know how I can pray the way this man does when there is no space for me to withdraw. But what I realized over time was that my life was actually the location of prayer for me. It was my cave. I didn't have to withdraw in order to pray. I could engage my life as a prayer. I could learn what I needed to learn from God in the context of my life as it was and as I learned to trust God more. Submission to your life circumstances can be a form of prayer because it's a really tangible way of submitting to God and trusting that God will be there in the middle of our life, just as it is. We don't have to withdraw to a cave or even to a nook. We can build a place of prayer in the middle of our daily responsibilities. So name a spot or circumstance in your life where you experience a lot of resistance in yourself. And as you live into that circumstance, open yourself up to grace and love. Do what you have to do as a way of opening up to the flow of grace. And here's an example from my life. I had those two children four years apart back in grad school, but then four years later, we adopted two boys who were three and six. So I went from parenting a four-year-old and an eight-year-old to parenting a three, four, six, and eight-year-old. Now, I didn't need a cave to withdraw to in order to become a more loving and gracious person, nor did I have time to do that. These things started to grow in my life, grace and love, as I surrendered to the needs of all of these little people. God made me more gracious and loving through the circumstances of my life. And prayer was the act of surrendering control of my life to the care of these little ones. Making a peanut butter sandwich for the fifth time was laying the rug. Reading a story was lighting a candle. Sharing my bed with another hot little body and a heel in my chin was a verse on the wall. That life situation became a life of prayer. 
a life of grace and transformation for me. It was a way of actively praying. So this week, you're invited to find a place of prayer in your active life. Choose a spot. Where are you being blessed with discomfort? Consider that the first clue to where your spot might be. Or where in your life do you have to submit to the circumstances that you can't control? Lay the rug, light the candle, and begin your prayer.